His greatest desire, he told me, was to have 100 acres of land and a house for each one of his children. And when he passed, he certainly did. And those that did not have 100 acres of land had land equivalent or the same amount of um, monetary value as 100 acres of land. I think Joe Jackson opened a lot of doors, especially in this community. I think he made it possible for people to be able to go to that courthouse and purchase land and buy land and it not be odd for someone African American to do it. I think he got in the habit of buying and, and didn't know when to stop. <laughs> and my mother never said anything. She just said, Joseph, what did you buy today? So he said, oh, I bought a piece of land. Mom said, okay, and then that, that was it. Like I said, I guess he was just like women. And he go to the store and he wants something to just get it, and he just wanted land. He'd buy little or large, it didn't bother him. And then he'd turn right around and sell it sometime before he leave the grounds and go into the courthouse and uh, pay for it, and then they would have to pay him whatever he charged. I wasn't making millions or thousands, but he was making money. I think it's, it's, it's extremely neat, you know, all these real estate gurus going around talking about, you know, you buy property at a lower price and turn around and sell it and how you can do it in one day and make a profit. And, you know, before TV and radio and all that stuff, my grandfather was actually doing that. A thousand acres of land is a lot of land in any era. Um, and it's for a white person or a black person. And that would be an extraordinary amount. The importance of the Joe Jackson story is that it shows African-American resourcefulness and entrepreneurship during a time when people don't think that it existed. You know, I think people need to know how the black community in the hardest times amassed 15 million acres of land. People need to know how Joe Jackson took that land and uh, educated children with it took it and built houses and what it afforded him in terms of community leadership. So I think Joe Jackson's all over the country. That story need to be told because without that, we miss a great part of our heritage and history and the importance of land and a land base for the black community. I remember um, my great-grandmother uh, being uh, the daughter of a, of a former slave. Uh, and the farm that she worked on, uh, the, one of the gentlemen there uh, the costed her in, in a barn. And I don't know if it was a consensual uh, meeting or not, but uh, my grandfather never liked his father because of, of, of how the mother and, and, and he got together. The only thing he told me about his dad was that he saw him when he was a young man. This white man walked up to him and says, are you Joe Jackson? He said, yes. I said, who are you? He said, well, I'm your dad. The only thing I knew about my grandfather is my mother says that he worked on the railroad. And I never saw him. I never saw a picture of him. So I really don't know what he looked like except that he was white, I, we knew that. I think that in growing up, my grandfather had a very hard time. He was one of four, I believe, four siblings, and he started working at a very early age. He knew the value of a dollar, and he knew that he wanted to always have something so that he wouldn't have to live the way people lived that worked for other people. My father told me when he was a young boy that uh, he was about seven or eight years old, he was sitting in the kitchen and the, he was by the wall in the dining room and whoever was cooking, I don't know if it was his mother or whoever it was, was cooking the food and he would keep his ears to the wall and he heard the white people talking in the back 
about their farms and how the children were going to work and how they were going to save money and what they were going to do with their monies. They were going to buy more farms and they were going to go into business and Papa heard every bit of it. And he says, I made up my mind I was going to save money and buy my own land. I think they lived when he was growing up on, on the farm with this family and this man would always relax and tell him to bring water and he asked my grandfather what do you want to be when you grow up and he said I want to sit just the way you're sitting and have someone bring water to me and they laughed they thought that was the funniest thing I think my grandfather was motivated greatly by them laughing not what they said but just the idea of saying you can't do it you never will do it you are a colored man. The way that most black people uh, gained uh, a foothold in America was by land ownership because they uh, mocked what the white society did and land ownership was important to white society and blacks were attempting to follow to be good American citizens and own land. Actually 1885 was sort of a turning point up until that time period blacks were Black land ownership was very, very limited, but 1885 was really a time when there was burgeoning land ownership, particularly in Virginia. Virginia had the highest rate of increase of black land ownership starting in 1885. And again, it came out of slavery because this was their dream to be their own masters in a way, masters of their own fate. And being rural people coming from rural communities, land was a way of doing that. My father was in the church, and my mother was in the church, and my mother was considered a great soloist, which she had a beautiful opera voice. And uh, there was a couple there getting married this particular day at the church. And she didn't have a, um, no one to stand up with her, like a matron of honor or something like that. So the pastor of the church called out to my mother because she sang and you know at that church, and he says, Miss Wimbush, that was my mom, will you come up with the bride and groom? Then he looked around, the pastor looked around, he saw my father all dyked out in white. <laughs> and they asked him to come up with them. So that's when they met at someone else's wedding. And then after the wedding, my mother said, she said to his sister and a few of her good friends, she said, I'm going to marry that pretty boy. My mother tells me that my grandfather um, met my, my grandmother, Angeline, and fell in love with her and decided, well, he wanted to provide a house or home and a farm for her. So he told her that he was going to go over to West Virginia and work in the coal mines there and raise enough money to buy them a, a farm and a house. So I think at age 17, he went and worked in the mines, worked there for a couple of years, was able to come back, buy a mule, and buy, uh, buy I think, a 100-acre farm, and was able to build a house on that. So that, that's how I originally got started. Halifax County is in the central part of the state, if you will, right on the border with North Carolina. Uh, it's almost due north of Durham, Duke Hospital, Raleigh, that area. And we are right on the border, border county with North Carolina. And we're halfway between the coast and the mountains, if you will. Tobacco has always been the cash crop of the county for a long time. Tobacco remains, even today, a 30 to a $40 million crop for Halifax County. And it goes back to colonial times. The county was settled mainly by people coming here to grow tobacco. 
We grew up under a plantation culture, if you will. And of course, as you might imagine, the plantation culture depended among slave labor to work those plantations. And so as an offspring of that, we are almost 50-50, uh, black, white. And it goes back, if you will, they were here when slavery was in, in, in vogue and they remained here. And, and, and that's what we have today. Jim Crow was the sort of South's revenge for Reconstruction, and it was a way of Southerners, they were called the Redeemers, of taking back their region for white people. And it severely limited black people's opportunities, schools were off limits to them, public accommodations. The Supreme Court in Plessy v. Ferguson upheld Jim Crow, and so Jim Crow was a way of Southerners saying, we're not going to integrate our society. You may not be slaves any longer, but you're not going to be a part of our society. So this was a time of, of great stress in the black community. And many black people were leaving their farms to go north. So it was a time of exodus for some black people who had totally lost faith in the south. The way one author described it as being without sanctuary, there was no place that African Americans could be shielded and protected by law at either the federal, state, or county, or even city level. You see hundreds of African Americans being lynched. It's estimated that approximately 5,000 are on record as having been lynched, but it may be as many as 10,000 were lynched during that period. The acquisition of land was almost impossible since it was controlled by the government and people who simply wanted the land. W.B. Du Bois, the great sociologist, said that that period, uh, the 1910s, uh, 20s, and 30s, was the lowest point in the era for black being black in America, even lower than slavery, because slavery, at least there was a defined status, and there was intimidation, there was killing, but there we were supposed to be free, and we really weren't free. My grandfather purchased his first farm in, in 1908 and purchased a, a lot of different farms uh, throughout the 30s and 40s. Papa was the first black man in Halifax County to buy that amount of, amount of land at one time. And there were not any, as far as I knew at that time, or even heard Mama and Papa talk about, there was not one black person owned any land unless it was like a little spot next to a house in which they had been working. And uh, so Papa made great news and history in Halifax County as purchase, purchasing their own land. But I think they failed to find out how was he able to save that amount of money to pay down on the land. And so I started seeking, asking Mama, I said, Mama, how is it possible that he would save that kind of money to buy the land? And she said this, I prayed before I met him that God would give me a man would save his money, be it little or much. And she laughed. She said, but I didn't know he was going to save all of it, save much of it. That's how we're able to buy the land. And she began having children. They had the first child of the eight. They were married two years. And after that, I think they were two years apart. And when I came along, there were four years with my last sister, me. I have three brothers, and there were six girls. There's only three of us living now. My oldest brother was named Warren and Vivian's mother was named Mamie, then Langford, Wimbush, Irene, Adasha, myself, Lucille, um, Doris, and Janet. I was born down the road a little further, uh, and I think I was about two or three when I moved to this house here, which she built in 19... Um, 19, I think it's 1921. The guys knocked on it and hammered on it so long, he got tired of them and he said, you just get out, get out. And the house was incomplete, but they moved into this house. Of course, I don't remember that, I was too young. 
And that's where I grew up in that house. Forced out on the farm because we hadn't getting no day labor to do. We're only getting six bits and a dollar a day, and we can't make an honest, decent living at it. And that's the reason we're out here on Highway 61 right today. And we want to get a place to live and work and make an honest, decent living. I think my grandfather was able to take advantage of the fact that uh, he had money when a lot of folks didn't. Again, during the, the Depression, there were farmers who, who really couldn't make it, but my, my grandfather had the ability to farm and make money, and those who ran into to, to dire straits basically came to my grandfather, either sold their land to him or he lent money for them to save their farms. I believe my aunts and, and uncles did have a slightly more privileged uh, childhood than, than the other kids. Uh, I mean, there was always plenty of food. Uh, there was money, though my grandfather was real thrifty. Uh, they, they probably had more than, than the other folks, and, and certainly they were well respected. And my grandfather helped build the local church, the school. So yeah, he, he was a man amongst, amongst, amongst the community, I guess. Uh, we didn't know that was a hard time for people. We had what we grew and we didn't. My mother bought, my father would buy, because he had the money. Mom and Papa taught us values of life and to share, to be willing to share. And I recall as a child, Mama would send us through the woods, taking the little, I don't know where they purchased the little pails from, a gallon pail of milk and butter to the neighbors. Whatever we had, she would share with the neighbors. And sometimes she knew they didn't have and Papa always had plenty, you know, and plenty of hams and whatever. She would always cut the meat, she said, or ham, whatever, and send it by Doris, Vivian, and I through the woods. This old shed uh, storage building up here is where they uh, used to have a smokehouse. The uh, hams would actually be hanging from, uh, from those rafters and there was some sort of pit there to create the, you know, to give it the smoke smell. Everybody loved my father's ham. People that's living today that knew my father said they were the best. Because he knew how to uh, raise them well and how to smoke them. He used hickory uh, trees, and then he would throw in sassafra. We, uh, we call it sassafra, but it's sassafras. This meat you call today, so he could smoke that. That's nothing. Compared he had the real, to... the real stuff in the, and so mm. in the smoke, smokehouse. He would he have a, 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 a uh, fire going. Fire going, yes. That it would smolder. It wouldn't be blazed up. And and, and if we peep in the smokehouse, if it was blazing, we go and tell my mom, and she come in and sprinkle water on it, and then it would just be smoke. That's how he smoked his meat. If, if you weren't working too hard or working uh, diligently, it was 4 o'clock, and that, that's what grandfather used to say about lazy folks. It was basically quitting time at 4 o'clock, so if, if, if you weren't a diligent worker, 4 o'clock. He, he didn't have patience for lazy folks, so they didn't uh, regard him at all because he pushed them around. I mean, you're lazy, you, or he would just let them have it. You go do so-and-so. You want me to help and you're not doing anything. Oh, blah, blah, blah. He would go on and on and on and on. Papa was petite, small. Um, he wasn't big masculine, uh, with big muscles like other men were. Um, but yet he was strong, physically, emotionally, spiritually. I mean, in every way. I've never seen a man so small that was so strong. Mama said, the bull is out. And Papa told him, he's all right, I'll get him. He named all of his bulls, had names for them. And he went out that door and came around that way. He said, didn't I tell you not to come to the house? As if the bull would speak. And the bull kept pawing and pawing and coming closer to him. When he's pawing, a bull is pawing, he's preparing to attack. Papa didn't pay it any mind. He walked up to that bull and caught him by the horns and twisted that bull down 
with my own eyes, and I was sitting there just in tears. I thought the bull was going to hurt him. And he twisted the bull down, and the four feet of the bulls were in the air. That bull was in the air. And Papa says, now, I told you, I want you to get up now and go back to the fence. Don't you know, honest to goodness, I saw it. That bull got up and looked at Papa and went walking back very fast, and then he came back down into the fence and went back in. I shall never forget that. My father used to go and get ice. We used to make homemade ice cream just about every four Saturday that I can remember. And neighbors would come, and the sharecroppers would come and eat ice cream with us. And we always made pineapple ice cream. Other, other ice creams wasn't, didn't uh, ring a bell with us. We didn't have no vanilla and all that. They used vanilla with the pineapple, crushed pineapple. And that was oh so good. We've all, we always had plenty of food. We didn't have any money to spend. I don't know whether he didn't give us any because he didn't have it, but I always figured that if he could buy land, he could give us a little bit. But he, children didn't get have money like they do now. We didn't get no allowance. He didn't even know what it was, an allowance. He would thought you were out of your mind <laughs> if we had said something about an allowance. Well, my grandfather um, went, only, or, or went only through the, the fourth grade. Uh, but he did learn to read and write. Uh, I know he read the newspapers on a regular basis. So I think, you know, at his, in his time, education was, was pretty important. When my mother was growing up, uh, my grandfather actually had a school built um, just above where his farm was located. So that was the one minority school uh, in, the, in the area that my mother and all my aunts and brothers attended. Every day from school, somebody would come to have lunch with us. And they said, see, at the morning, they'd have a recess, a 10 minutes recess, and everybody would eat their lunch. They had that 10 minutes recess. So when 12 o'clock come, a lot of the kids didn't have lunch. And we would, they would come home with us and have dinner. And then they would go back to school. Go see, we would write it. We'd just run down to the house. And sometimes the teacher would send a note to ask what Mama gave the kids, you know, lunch. My grandmother went to school with um, Victor's mother, Mrs. Brock. And um, she said that um, a lot of times um, they always wore really nice clothes to school and, you know, just always had paper. That's what she always say. They had paper and pencils. And I was like, well, Grandma, you know, you didn't have... She says, well, you know, sometimes you didn't have money for those things. A lot of people in Halifax now don't have running water and plumbing and those kind of things. So back then, for Mrs. Brock and her family, the Jacksons, to have running water, lights, uh, a refrigerator, all those kind of things, um, that was really a big deal. You have to be motivated. You have to want something in life. But to get it honestly is more important than I want to be rich and I want to hurt others to step on others to become that which I like. So Papa didn't step on anybody. Black people who were prosperous, who had had any kind of, of assistance from other people, felt it was their responsibility to turn around and help others as well. And that's one of the remarkable stories of the post-slavery world, is how black people did cooperate with one another. A friend used to come. He's still living. He's old, a little older than I am. He used to come here and talk to my dad. He used to drive for him after all of us left home. Henry Jones is his name and get information from my father. And my father was telling him how to buy farms, how to buy cattle, and he took my father's advice. And he owns quite a bit of land now. I really learned a lot from him. If uh, I hadn't learned a lot from him, I wouldn't have been as poor as I am today. I own 400 acres of land now myself. And I got that experience from him. I used to take him to these sales, he bought a whole lot of land for different people, and I used to take him around. He had an old truck. Oh, I think that was about a 1951, uh, I believe, old truck. And I used to drive it. He couldn't drive nothing but a mule and a wagon. Ooh. And he drove that uh, up to my house to pick up me. Then when he picked me up on the mule wagon, I'd come back and get him and get the old truck. And then we'd go, we'd go around, uh, the around to the farm and so forth, to the sales and so forth. Joe Jackson was the oldest man I knew around. He had the money, to be frank with you. I mean, he had a, well, could help you, you know, with some money. You know, you take a whole lot of people got money, but you don't know how to operate with it. And Joe Jackson knows how to operate his money. He you know, you know where to spend this dollar for to make two of them. Here's the early 1920s, I think, county map, uh, and it shows the various uh, magisterial districts uh, of the county. 
you look at our records, we did not make a distinction of color until, I'm not sure what they said, but late on in, in 1860, 70, 80, there was no distinction in color. And then it became an issue for a while, and of course now it's not an issue. There's no, at one time, even since I've been here, we were to de uh, delineate the race on a marriage license. Thank goodness we've got to the point today that it's not an issue in most cases. It's, it's still in some cases, of course, but in most cases it's not. Certainly not the clerk's office. We don't know the difference. You bring in a deed, we record it. We don't look at you. You know, we record it, and, and you know, same thing for marriage and deeds and wills. It's, it's no difference there. This, this actual uh, land book is dated 1929, and it's actually broken down into two sections, a section for, for whites and also a section for, for colored, as, as they called African Americans back then. And uh, I see here where my grandfather had purchased uh, 266 uh, acres uh, in the Bradley Creek area of Halifax County. And he actually purchased it for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, $2,500. So that, that's probably worth a quarter of a million now. So that was probably a pretty good buy back then. These auctioneers and different things, people, lawyers and whatnot, they knew my dad. So when we walked on the lawn, my husband and I and my father, and the auctioneer screamed out, uh, Joe Jackson is here. We'll begin the sales. Just like that. I was shocked. I looked around, and my father was standing there doing this. I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, look at this man, if you please. So I answered my husband. I said, they're waiting for him. He said, yes, he said he was going to buy it, didn't he? So uh, he must have talked to the lawyer. I don't know that. But they were started off at 10000 10,000, who would give it? Uh, uh, 12,000, and he went on like 200 more, and nobody did. And they said, sold to Joe Jackson. I didn't know that he had bought it. I'm standing beside him. Sold to Joe Jackson, because no one else bid it against him. One of the lessons that my grandfather taught my mother was to wait till the very end of the bidding, until all the other bidders have bid it out, whatever amount they wanted. And once the, the auctioneer was about to close the bidding, to, to enter the bid process at that time. So that was a lesson that was passed down to me. So whenever I go to auctions, I wait till the very end, till the auctioneer counts it down to two, and then, then I become involved. So we jumped in the car and we went on down to Lawyer McLaughlin in Halifax. He was the biggest lawyer down there. And he went to him. He said, not again, Joe. That's what the lawyer said. He said, yeah, I just bought that farm up in Brookneal. And he shook my father's hand. Of course, he's getting money, too, of course. And uh, he wrote up the papers and whatnot. And about six men, all white, got around my father in the lawyer's office. And I said, what is this going to be here? They said, we'll rent it. We'll rent the farm. We'll rent the farm. My father said, $1,000 a year for three years. Now, he paid 10000 In three years, he made $3,000 just like that. And after that, the end of three years, and I was back here again, he said, Sugar, you know that farm I bought? I said, yes. He said, guess what I sold it for today? I said, what? He said, 16000 three years later. So that's how he operated. People now, they have to sign a contract for everything. My father's handshake was his binding to him as a contract would be if he had a lawyer to do that. And everybody who did business with him knew that. If he gave his word, that was, that was it. I know my grandfather used to spend a lot of time in the courtrooms, just sitting in the, in the back of the courts and, and kind of listening to the attorneys battle it out. And he determined who a better attorney was, and, and that's who he'd take his business to. I was involved in right many sales of lands, or what we call partition suits, sale of lands for division among the heirs and so forth. And usually they were at public auction and well advertised. And frequently I recall seeing Joe Jackson there. And uh, he was a good analysis of the value of land. He knew what land was worth and when to buy it and when not, and I think he did quite well at it. He bid like others did and were more or less considered uh, you know, one of the boys. 
Money is the great equalizer. Land and money and assets. If you had money, maybe he couldn't go in that coffee shop and drink coffee with some attorney or whatever who may have filed his deed for him. I'm sure that attorney would take his money <laughs> and work for him. Through all of segregation and Jim Crow and all of that, all the separation they might have had uh, upstairs in the movie for the black, and downstairs for the white, they might have had in the restaurant, they might have had back there. We were separated. But one thing they never had but one of them, that was cash register. The money all went in the same register. If, if Joe Jackson had money, if he came back here with money and he wanted to be it on property, they wouldn't have had no problem with that. You could buy land, or they wanted the money. All these white folks want the money. You had the money, you buy anywhere you want to buy. Well, no, I haven't said it either. Not anywhere you want, but most anywhere you want. Like in some place in town, like when I back there, you couldn't buy there where you want to buy. But the most of the place, you could. All out in the country, you buy land most anywhere. If the hell going to sell it, then you can buy it. I recall vaguely examining the title of some deeds. Uh, and said uh, something about it. it could not be made to a black person because they are more susceptible to some excuse, some disease, or something like that. And uh, I was, I rec can't recall the detail, but I rem remember uh, reading some deeds to that effect, limiting the use to black people. That was a long time ago, but that did happen. My grandfather had a difficult time because he would go to sales and there was always someone, a white person there to purchase for him. That property that I have up on 501, it was sad that no blacks would ever own property on the main highway 501. And he laughed because he already owned hundreds of acres there, of course. He would nod to the person, as far as I could understand him saying, and they would purchase for him. So I'm sure he had a very difficult time. I remember seeing Pablo, I shall never forget, walking down the street in Halifax. And whenever he would see any woman, a white woman, or any, we didn't hardly see any black women, he would take his hat off and bow. I mean, it was, I shall never forget, a remarkable. He didn't look at her eyes, he didn't look at her face, he just saw her coming in the distance. And he didn't lift his hand, he's still walking. He didn't lift his eyes until he passed her. I believe this is when all of the white men, all of the men in business, all those stores knew him by his name, Joe Jackson. He probably didn't draw a lot of attention to himself. I mean, he knew what he was going up to the courthouse to do to file a deed, but I'm sure he, he made sure that he was very polite to all the ladies up in that office and, you know, he sugar-coated it a little bit, you know, how you doing, sweetie, or, you know, I'm sure he didn't say sweetie, ma'am, <laughs> or, you know, sir, and people are, are a lot more apt to do business with you if they know who you are and kind of know where you're coming from. If you would see him come down the road right now, you would think it was a hobo. And sometime his wife had to make him put on clothes to clean up. He had some clothes here with an old bag on his back, and and he'd go to these sales, and they recognized him, though. They knew who he was. I think uh, my grandfather was shrewd enough to not stir up a whole lot of waves. So again, he could maneuver pretty easily. But again, if, if, if he were white, he wouldn't have had that, that obstacle of, of maneuvering or, or, or trying to gain acceptance and, and walking into a courtroom or, or walking into a, a business establishment. Those are things that, that, that white business people didn't have to deal with. So it was that extra burden, I think. Going to the courthouse and buying a couple of acres here, a couple of acres there, uh, probably didn't generate the kind of attention of going in and letting everybody know as far as printing in the paper or letting the whole community know by parade that, that you acquired five acres of land. If you uh, advertised and gave signals that you own certain things or you had certain kinds of behavior or you acquired too much education, then you became what they call an uppity the nigger and that was not a proper thing to be in counties where there were uh, vigilante com committees and political systems that wanted to keep blacks in their place.
the one thing that I noticed about being here is, is just the whites here never seem to want to let go of the, the Confederate history. And, and everywhere you look, there's, there's something Confederate, you know, a Confederate parade or this Confederate memorial. That, to me, is, is, is um, kind of disturbing. I think after the Civil War, it's when we started as a society making uh, references to, to the different. And I think it, it has heightened all the way up. It's, it's become more of an issue, not in, in recent time, but through the 20s and 30s and 40s. And then as the, the school the desegregation came along, we really polarized, if you will. We really took opposite corners. I remember the on my grandfather's farm, there was a, a white sharecropper family that lived on the farm, and I'll, I'll never forget this. This was when they first started talking about integrating the schools. And he came in, he couldn't read nor write. And he crossed his legs and put his feet on the coffee table. He said, he leaned over to my grandfather, he said, you know, before I let my kids go to school with the colors, I'll keep them at home and teach them myself. And I remember how angry my grandmother became because we could hear them talking. They were in the living room and she came down the hall and saw his feet on the coffee table. And here he is saying that before I let my kids go to school with the coloreds, I'll teach them myself. They would never learn anything because he couldn't read. When you went to the store, if you were standing in line at the cash register, and a white lady or a white child would come up. They would wait on, they, you know, like maybe five or six colored people were standing there to be waited on, and a white lady would walk up, and she would just, the, the, the clerk would just beckon back for her to come on up. And you just, I mean, I guess people just accustomed to it and they never paid any attention to it, because they've been doing it all their life. We were maybe pushed aside at some times with the whites, but then you got to know your, where, you, where you're wanted and where you're not wanted. The same things apply to New York. Uh, maybe you go in, they just send up a dirty nose at you, you know. Well, you know not to go back there anymore. We didn't make this world and didn't make these people, so you leave them alone, let their minds do what they tell them. Whether you're black, green, blue, purple, and white, I have friends of many different races and many different places because I've traveled more than two-thirds around the world and I've made friends. And so, they're people, they're blood, they're white, they're black, <laughs> you know? So what difference does it make? I know with my mom, I, she rarely mentions, you know, prejudices that she's had to face. Uh, if I press her and I ask her, she, she may remember an instance or two. But uh, I think it's in the past, and they just try to leave it there, as far as African Americans are concerned, and, and, and think about how, how much things have changed versus how they used to be. Everybody knows, you know, what happened back in when, they, when integration happened and all those kind of things. I think I, how I like to think of it is um, oh, they used to have a store downtown, like a department store. And, you know, they used to have colored bathrooms, and they used to have bathrooms for white people. Well, they took this tags down, but they left the little plates up, and it had colored and white. You could still see it. For some reason, in this department, so they still hadn't painted these doors. So, you know, out of tradition, the black people would still go in the colored bathroom. The white people would still go in the white bathroom. So I said, Grandma, why don't we go in that one one day? She said, well, you can go in there if you want to. I just like going over here. She said, you can go in there. So it was OK to go, but it was kind of just like they kind of were set in their ways. I think that, you know, you don't want to dig up old wounds. All the wounds are probably still there. But I think country folks have a way of just saying, well, let it be. I know black folk that didn't like to look at Roots when it was on TV 20 years ago, because they said, that's too harsh. I know African-Americans right now said, we shouldn't teach our children about slavery because it's too brutal. I think that's a mistake. And so I think they sometimes when you ask them about their history, ask them about what happened, not even back in those days, but in the 50s and the 60s, they don't want to talk about it. And I think that we have to talk about that. I think we have to let our children know what we went through so that they can learn from us. I 
I acquire properties. I don't really deal in farms, but I, I purchase homes. And we purchase homes from Chesapeake all the way down to Danville, Virginia. So the fact that my grandfather had, uh, had been involved in real estate, my father passed away when I was a young man, so I had his legacy to go by and not really my father's. My earliest memory, I think, is, is reminding my grandfather that his, uh, his horse that he loved so much, Moses, had gotten out of the stable. So I can remember shouting to him, Moses is out the stable. And I think he went outside and put him back in. But that, that's the very earliest memory. And probably next to that, I remember walking up the uh, dirt road with my grandfather and just helping him uh, pull his, his horse up the road. When I returned uh, to Halifax County from, from living in New York, um, I went to work with Burlington Mills, which is a, a, a cloth or textile mill in Halifax County, and a, a mill that had been open for about 50 years. So some of the longtime employees there approached me after they heard who I was, and to my surprise, they they, they greeted me as though I was almost a celebrity, that you know Joe Jackson's grandson, and uh, some of the the white people who worked in the in the uh, mill said that their parents held my grandfather in very high esteem uh, and instead of calling him uh, say Uncle Joe or Joe as they called most African Americans at the time they called him Mr. Joe Jackson. What, what, uh, what street does Nana live on? Joe Jackson Trail. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I think they named it after him because you, oh, you get, a, get a road named after you if you have the most... Daddy! Land on the road, so I guess yeah, he the most Joe land on that Jackson. road. So that's Joe Jackson. Jackson. One time I accidentally ate a bug. He has shown us, Victor's grandfather, that land is very important, and if you have it, you can definitely something you can pass down. And the more you have, truly, the more that you have to give to your, to your next generation. Grab right here. I'm in. You want to climb across the top? No, I want to climb the top for you. My father always said, they're not making any more land. And that was sort of the, the mantra of, of people long ago, that land was very, very important. The height of black land ownership was in 1910, and African Americans owned something like 15 million acres of land. Now, it's a little over 1.1 million acres. There's a popular myth that much of the black men who were lynched in the United States were lynched because they had whistled at a white woman or something like that. In fact, many of them were lynched because the people wanted their land. They knew if they could kill somebody, they could literally take the land from them. The loss of land has been incredibly um, devastating, I think, to the economic development of, of the black community. You go from being an owner to being a renter, not having capital, not being able to make investments that you can make when you own things. And if you don't have the tradition of ownership, um, you're not as much a part of the place and you don't have a, the same sense of, of connection as, as people who are sort of engaged in what they call the American dream, and that is home ownership, land ownership. A lot of old people around here, um, the children do sell off the land and then they wish they hadn't, and a lot of People buy it really cheap and kind of, I think they don't give them what it's worth sometimes because they see the quick dollar and not the, the long run of it. I just wish sometimes that some of the older people would have said, you know, you really need to hold on to this. Somehow or another, I think Joe Jackson understood that this land gave him strength. He loved land and he, he realized the value of having it. I think the land will probably just stay in, in the family overall. Um, my mother has an acre, acre and a half here. Hopefully I'll own that in you time will. to come. <laughs> unless, I, unless I give it to the girls. I don't want to do that. They wouldn't know how to handle yeah, it. But <laughs> our, our, That's still yours. <laughs> yeah, my intentions are is to always keep this, this property. Joe Jackson didn't have to uh, go on anybody else's property and share crop. Joe Jackson didn't have to send his kids over to the neighbor's house to pick corn or pull tobacco. They could stay right here. And they, you know, Mrs. Brock, Aunt Janet, and all of them were able to travel, believe it or not, and do things. Because their father had left them this land and had all this property, they were able 
not to marry as quickly and not to have to work for somebody else. The land made themselves sufficient. I mean, if they chose to go off and do these things, I mean, I, I think one or two of them even went to college. I never wanted to go away to New York to stay. I only wanted to go to visit. I never wanted to stay, and I wanted to visit because my oldest brothers and sisters, my family were there. I just wanted to see New York. But after arriving in New York, I did not like it because I love the country. There was freedom here. There was fresh vegetables and fresh food, and there was not there. And I had to buy everything there. Here, I didn't have to buy anything. So there was a difference, and I always longed to come home. Well, we all were sort of wanted to be here on this place. It was sort of what we grew up. You know, if, if where you grow up, if you're going to come back to your country, you want to go to your homestead or whatever. We call it homestead, home house. Everybody got to have a home. And if they buy a home by their own, it uh, can't be kicked about. Every time, every time they say pay the rent, if you don't pay it, they kick out. But I figure everybody need a home in order to buy the land. Most people, when they say home place, that's where the family, the elderly people live, and now the children have inherited the grandkids or anything. But it's just always been the home place. He always said he wanted all of his children to have a farm. He didn't want to sell it all. Everybody have their own farm and live where they want to. And uh, I chose to take my old farm that he gave me when I first got married. But afterwards, I didn't want to be up there. So I sold it and bought some from Janet here. Then Lucille down here, she didn't sell all of her farm, which is up on 501. She bought some from Janet so we could be at the home place. You know, be together, say. the word of homecoming you know with the black church the black community everybody would come back to homecoming and they're coming back to the home place that heritage of ownership the homecoming of a family back when you had that kind of thing you didn't we didn't have to deal with drugs we didn't have to deal with any of those kinds of things because that 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 community took care of that since I was about seven or eight, that we always have homecoming at Fort Sun in July. And it used to be hot, hot, hot. And that was before air conditioning. And they, it, the church would be full and the people would be standing outside. So that all the windows were open and people would have, you know, standing outside looking in the window listening to the minister.
grandfather was approximately 80 years old when he passed. He actually dropped dead on the, uh, the floor of the uh, local bank with $70,000 on his purse. Papa's funeral was most unusual. There were, there were no seats available. I mean, outside the building, there were like four, four or five rows in a row from the church. Those that he did not help financially or in their business areas, uh, they remembered how he had given them food in all those years. Many white men were there with their wives. And that was the first time in my life I'd seen an integration funeral. Lawyers were there, uh, doctors, um, uh, businessmen, the bankers, it was just so many people, you know, and, 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 and I don't think I heard anybody cry. I don't think so. I didn't because I knew that he had taught me well and now that if it was a tear shedding, it was for my own self, that I hope I could live the rest of my life uh, doing something to help others. There's such a focus, an understandable focus, on the hardships of slavery and the post-slavery world. And you don't want to romanticize this. And because some people might read in the sea, every black person could have made it if they were just as resourceful and you know as plucky as Joe Jackson. But you don't want to lose sight of his story of his successes and his efforts because you're afraid that people will make him emblematic of what blacks could have accomplished during that time. Every black could have had a thousand acres. That's not the case. But it's important to talk about this because it does show black resourcefulness. It does show um, cooperation. And it's a story of family, of a commitment to family that was driving him. He did this for his children. If we're not careful, by the turn of the century, the black community would be a landless people. And when you get landless, we don't have that connectivity back to the community, back to the land. We don't have the ownership. We're not taxpayers. And this is why I think the, if you're going to restore something in community, we have to restore ownership. We have to look at people like Mr. Jackson and say that need good citizenship. That made a good economic base for our community. This is the model that we have to use. And I think people like that should go down in history as generally heroic in our community because of the opportunity, because of their vision of ownership of land and this type of thing. It has to happen that way. You know, Mr. Jackson's story is one of, another example of the untold heroes and sheroes in the African-American community who persevered despite areas of, I mean, absolute racism, intimidation, death threats, and so forth, that quietly went about, you know, enhancing their lives for themselves as well as their children. And those stories are just, I mean, there's hundreds of these stories around the country, but we just don't hear about them a lot. You know, some people may say, oh, he must have had somebody helping him. And you know, they may not want to give, you the, give him the credit, but I think, too, that is up in the courthouse, filed. It's, um, it's on record. This man did this in that time span. And however he did it, <laughs> he did it. Um, he had to be humble, I'm sure. He had to not cross over a lot of feet, step on, step on anybody's toes. And like he said, I don't know if he walked up there, took the buggy, but he got up there somehow or another. And he, he left all this stuff for his children. Um, now, what they decide to do with it is up to them. Yeah, I, I think my grandfather's story is unique. Uh, he, he persevered when others couldn't. He was able to achieve things that, that not only African Americans would have liked to have achieved, but, but white folks as well. Uh, the fact that he, he acquired all that he did during the, the, the Depression, uh, that, that was difficult for anyone to do. So I, I think, yeah, he's, a, he's an important figure in, in achieving the American dream by his hard work and his diligence and perseverance.